Welcome to Kirsty TV. Thank you so much for being here. Today we have an incredible guest. We are here on September 11th, 2013, and we want to honour and remember all of the people who lost their lives. That tragic day when 102 minutes changed everybody's lives and really changed the world in a lot of ways. When Terrorists hijacked some planes and flew them into the Twin Towers in New York City, killing 2,700 people. My guest today, Michelle Rosado, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Kirsty. And Michelle was a survivor of that day, um, on a day when a lot of her co-workers and friends lost their lives. So, Michelle, I was thinking today as I went downstairs in my building and the girls were in their office, they're these young, vibrant, beautiful girls in their early 20s just going to work. And for you, it was a lot like that on that day, wasn't it? It was probably one of the most beautiful days I've ever seen in New York City. There were times where in Manhattan you never saw the sun, mainly because everybody just so focused on getting to work, not even realizing what the environment looked like. And it just turned out that it was almost like Indian summer where it was probably 78 degrees in the morning, it was so vibrant, everybody was looking forward to spending time with their relatives or spending time in the World Trade Center as, as tourists would do most of the time. And that morning seemed to be very poignant because I didn't really have to be at work that early. I showed up at work at 8.30 that morning. I was working on a presentation for the UN and I was asked to come in at 8.30 that morning instead of the regular 9 o'clock. So when I, when I came out of the subway and approached the building, I was tempted to go back into the subway station and play hooky. Probably just go to the beach, hang out with my friends. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I had to go to work. So what mm -hmm. I did was I ascended, like everybody else did, up in the elevator to the 95th floor of Tower 2. And so when you went to work that day, d did you feel any different? Do you, was there a pre-premonition of any kind? There was no premonition that day. But what I did notice was that everybody that I worked with, that I knew would be there early, always had a camaraderie. Everybody who worked at the company that I worked for, Fiduciary Trust, we all worked so well together. We were like a family because there were only 850 of us that occupied only a few floors of Tower 2. So we had so much to give to each one of us, to each other. And when I got to my desk, I worked for a team of four people, and I was the first one there. And I said to myself, this is great. I have a couple of, you know, I have a few minutes just for myself. I can drink a cup of coffee. I can go downstairs. I can just have time for myself. And about 8.35 was when my ex-boyfriend called me at the office. And I had broken up with him about a month ago, a month before then, and I was annoyed. I remember saying, I don't, I don't really appreciate you calling me. I don't, I have a busy day ahead of me. I knew I had a presentation to do for the UN. I was very, I was very excited to work, and I practically hung up on him. And looking back, I knew that that was somewhat rude. But in retrospect, I realized that whatever happened after that, was going to change everybody's lives, and I knew that it was okay. Uh, as soon as I hung up the phone, I heard the roar of an airplane engine. I got up because I had a feeling. I said, why, are, why do I hear an airplane? Even though we were 95 floors up, we never heard an airplane engine. The next thing I knew, I felt the energy of a plane, and it crashed into Tower 1. The glass in my office shattered to the floor. I looked behind me and I saw flames and people were just screaming, everybody get out of the building. I grabbed the two most personal things. I took my briefcase and my purse. We, I ran to the nearest staircase and my coworker Lori grabbed me and she said, you're taking the elevator. And I said, no, because in usual times you never take you never take the elevator in an emergency situation because I thought that a plane must have hit our building for the building to be shook like that. And mm -hmm. so she dragged me into the elevator and she and my coworker Andrew descended to the 90th floor. The 90th floor was filled with people who worked for um, human resources. Some of the IT people, the computer people worked there. 
And when, we, when the doors opened, I thought that people would just run in. And unfortunately, what I saw were people on their cell phones screaming. They were saying, I, I'm, I'm still here, but I don't know what to do. And nobody got into that elevator. So when the doors closed, there was a feeling of enormous guilt. I said to myself, how can people not want to go? The next thing I knew, we, we descended to the 78. that they didn't realize how serious this was at the, that point? I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Even though they were frantic on the phone, I didn't think that they had a feeling of, well, what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Secondly, what really was going on in the upper tower. So we descended to the 78th floor, and that's where the, ma the main elevator bank was. And I just saw people, hundreds of people, running to the elevator. And as soon as Lori and I ran into one of the elevators, people were shoving each other in there so badly that someone said, okay, that's enough people, that's enough. So I still saw people in that elevator bank scrambling to get on other elevators. And usually the trip from the 78th floor to the lobby had to be maybe about eight minutes, I believe. It felt wow. like 15. So there were a lot of people who wouldn't have been able to get on elevators in time because between the first tower being hit and the second, it was only 15 minutes, wasn't it? Right. And, and, and really, the time for you, for this to have impacted, you get in the elevator and get downstairs. It was very close. Because when we got in, out of the elevator into the lobby, the first vision of what the devastation was, when I looked to my left, there were pieces of office papers, there, were computer equip there was computer equipment, a big, huge chunk of steel was burning on the ground. I saw Lori as she just ran out onto Liberty Street, and then my boss called, well, actually I called my boss, my manager, she was working from home, and she said, what's going on? I said, a plane, I think a plane just hit the World Trade Center, so she didn't know. I, first, see, I think when that, when something like that happens, most people were either at home or they were trying to find their way to work, so a lot of people were just not clear as to what was going on. Mm. And uh, as soon as I walked out of the building with my coworkers, I heard the same exact sound, the roar of the second plane engine. And I watched as it, the second plane crashed into Tower 2, into the upper floors. What's it like to see, I mean, that must have just been so surreal because it would really be like something out of a movie. It was, well, when you look back at the footage, it almost looks like one of these Hollywood movies that you see people you know, frantically trying to get out of people's way, uh, explosions, and that's really how it was. I, I found myself at a place where I just didn't understand what was going on anymore. I didn't see, I didn't see anything that felt real to me. Well, there's an excerpt in your book, which I'll just read now, and it just really encapsulates everything of that moment, and this is just as... Um, I watched it smash into Tower 2. The tower burst into flames and the street erupted into full-scale pandemonium. People turned into maniacs and thrashed through the streets in mass hysteria. I was thrown into a steel barricade and as Andrew helped me up, a scene that is still embedded in my mind began to unfold. Shattered glass, burning ceilings, steel, cement, fiberglass, pulverised, and people, fellow humans leaping to their deaths, taking the only action they could to think of to in order to escape. <sighs> wow. So I think that, you know, people forget that this was real, especially now with it being so many years having passed. And I, I think that reading your articles and your book and hearing your story remind us all that this isn't a history lesson. This is something that happened to so many people. That one day made an impact on so many people around the world that it almost transformed how they thought about themselves, how they thought about other countries. And I think that it took New York for what it is. Uh, it was a resilient city. It was filled with strong people mm -hmm. who have been known to have bad attitudes and all of a sudden became these people of kindness and generosity and they showed so much class 
And I'm just, you know, when you when I hear you read from the book like that, I I can't help but bring myself back to the day and actually see that. That was a suppressed memory. I did not remember look watching people jump from those buildings until the 50 year anniversary when I spoke with Andrew. He and wow. I had a conversation. He ha he he asked me if it was something that I wanted to know from him because he remembers everything. And I said, did I really see people jump? And he explained to me what happened. And then those remem those memories became clear to me again. That's probably one of the most uh, painful memories of that day. One of the most painful. Yeah. What do you think was going on for those people? Because they would have only had minutes to make that decision because you, you were up there, you know, had you not taken that elevator, you would have still been in your office 15 minutes later. And it wasn't like they had half an hour, an hour sitting up there to think about this. This was just all came, you know, people didn't even have time to process it really in a lot of ways. I don't think they did. I know that certain, you know, some of my coworkers did call their parents, their loved ones, telling them that they could not get out. And that's obvious, that's another very painful memory because that night there were parents of the victims who were calling me at home, actually at my mother's house, asking if they'd seen their son or their daughter. And it, it really brings back the reality of what was happening. But in terms of people who were there, if I could put myself in their shoes, I could see why they had to take their own life. Or they just stand, they stood there and let the building collapse with them. I, I understand, um, I guess because I did face death, and I, and I almost, because I have no fear of it anymore, I, I see as if they were at peace. No matter what they did, they became at peace with what they were doing. So when did it start to sink in for you? So this this 15 minute period when you know all of this is going on and then it's chaos, then everybody's running and trying to get out of the building and you faced a two or three hour walk then to even just get to safety. Were you thinking during that time about what had happened or were you still in shock? I was in complete shock. My coworker Andrew and I were in the South Street Seaport when the Tower 2 collapsed. He and I walked up the FDR Drive, which was, I don't know, maybe a couple of miles, but we watched as the tower collapsed, and I just remember turning around and saying, okay, I guess we need to start walking. There was no, there was no perception of death. There was no perception of damage, even though we saw people complete, completely covered in soot and blood and, and just, you know, they were in the most destructive part of the city. I had no feeling at all. It was almost like I was a mindless body just walking. And you were covered in soot. I mean, you'd gone to work in your heels, in your suit, and I love how you mention your magenta blouse. Um, but you know, you'd gone there, this young, successful businesswoman, and now you're staggering up the highway like a zombie, and covered in soot and debris and in blisters, um, and obviously in a lot of not just mental pain but physical pain. It was, it was almost like I was, I was asking myself, what am I doing here? This, I'm not supposed to be here. This, this feels like I should be in some kind of war zone. Everybody who's in business suits, everybody who's just, you know, not, not the officers. The officers and, and the Marines and the Navy SEALs are supposed to be doing this kind of stuff. They're trained to be able to handle this kind of devastation. People who worked in the World Trade Center, most of them were normal business people, executives, assistants, what have you. They were not equipped for that kind of day. And then everybody, um, I love how you call them your human angels that you met that day. So as you're walking up the highway there were people coming out with water and did it touch you, the humanity, in the midst of all of that pain? Having them Having watched them give us cups of water, 
the tears started to they started to come. And just for a moment, because I realized that Andrew and I were not running a marathon. We were not running with sneakers, and and these great people are waiting for us by the, at the end of the finish line. These were people who had tables and tables of cups of water, looking to give us whatever they could and help us get home. It's very beautiful. And even the taxi driver, how you talk about, you know, he, he didn't care that you didn't have any money, he just knew that he had to get you home. That cab driver, in, in a lot of ways, saved my life. Because he, t he taught me about not looking at what's going on in my past. He actually taught me about, okay, you're in a cab, I'm taking you home, no need to go to an ATM, I'll take you home, don't worry, don't worry. And I didn't even know him. He was a complete stranger, and he I'll never forget him. I think that's the beauty in, you know, there's a huge part of it that I think all of us struggle with. How can other human beings do this to another human being? And in when that's happening for us, we need these moments of humanity to remind us that, that it's not everybody, it's not the whole world, it hasn't gone evil. I'm just, I'm so glad you said that because as someone who was in the building, I get a lot of, I get a lot of emails from people who say, how could you find yourself at a place of forgiving these people? And I keep asking, well, who are you talking about? If you are talking about a religious sector or you are talking about a race or anything else that does not, that takes away from who truly did this, there's no such thing for me anyway, as hatred, because that would mean that I am using every bit of the life that, I, that was saved for me to, to just waste away for the rest of my life. And I just can't do mm -hmm. that. So what did you do that day? When did you get home and did you see your family? What was the first thing that happened when you got out of that cab and you were home? I went to my mother's house and my brother was there. The first thing he did was just hug me. He ran up to me and hugged me. And it actually, it took me a minute to realize what he went through. And I had no idea what happened. But at 10.30 that morning, my former co-worker called him at my mother's house and said, what are you doing? Don't you, wonder, don't you know what, where your sister is? And my brother said, what are you talking about? He was asleep. He was partying the night before in college. And he was just, yeah, he didn't understand. And as soon as he turned on the TV, he saw the second, uh, the second tower collapse. And the first thing he saw was, the, the thought that came to him was, I need to plan my sister's funeral. Gosh. Yeah, there were a lot of loved ones, I'm sure, that struggled for hours and days, some of them not knowing whether or not their loved ones had made it. So that day, you're home with your family. Could you get to sleep? Uh... I went to sleep at about 1 o'clock that night because I was getting calls from family members of my coworkers up until about 11.30 or midnight. And I remember just sitting at my brother's room just saying, I guess I don't have work tomorrow. I guess I, I don't know where I'm going to be living anymore because I had an apartment in Manhattan. And it was nowhere near the World Trade Center, but I had, I had to get out of there nevertheless. I needed to... I felt like I need to start my life over again, quickly. And when you woke up the next day, did you remember what had happened? When I woke up, I woke up about, I'd say 11.30 in the morning. I woke up in my brother's room. I don't, I don't remember, I didn't remember where I was. And the TV was on, and I saw the footage. My brother came over to me with a sheet of paper and said, you need to call these people. And I said, who is it? And he said, he said it was a court authority. You need to be accounted for. And I've never, I, I, don't even, I didn't even know what that meant. So I called and they said, Michelle Cruz? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you're accounted for. Like I was, uh, you know, like I was in a war zone. You know, or, or some kind of plane crash where they're trying to look at the names of the manifest and seeing who survived this. It was just complete mayhem going on in my mind. When did it sink in that so many of your co-workers hadn't made it? Day after day, 
from the first day up until the second week, more and more of, of our friends, and I say our because my best friend Jennifer was also in the building and she and I had a lot of close friends together, and we just noticed how for every single day there were more and more people who decided to stay at work. And, uh, Heartbreaking. Yeah. So did you start to go through survivor guilt, post-traumatic stress? What was going on for you as those days started to pass? Well, immediately after September 11, I started to feel survivor's guilt. I started to say to myself, why is it that I took the elevator and I survived while people were taking the stairs like they should have in an emergency situation and not make it? Then I started feeling, what is so special about me? There's nothing that I've done. I haven't changed the world. I haven't done anything that could impact the lives of others. Why is it that special people had to go and I had to stay? Now what do I do? It was pretty much all about ego. Uh, just saying to myself, well, why is it, you know, why me? Why, why is it me? Yeah, I imagine it would be really hard, especially when you know those people and you've seen, as you say, people left on the platform knowing those elevators weren't going to get a chance to refill and take anybody else. But as the days went on, I, mean, I think part of the, the additional trauma with any event like this, I mean, even like the Boston Marathon, um, the killings in the movie theatres, when something is so publicised in the media, it's almost like you have to relive it minute by minute, day by day, um, for weeks on every news channel possible. Was that hard for you to be seeing this again and again? I wish I could say it was hard, but it wasn't at first. It was almost as if I was watching the footage over and over and over again to remind myself that this was real. In mm -hmm. fact, I found myself walking around the streets of New York purposely bumping into people because I wanted to feel that I was still alive. So the reality yeah. of the the reality was I needed I needed to see the footage, not of the horrific footage of people jumping or anything mm -hmm. like that, but just knowing that yes, my my job is not there anymore. And I have to face what is right now. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you were trying to fit it into your head so that it would comprehend that this was real. Exactly. Because if not, I would have found myself, hard, it would be harder and harder for me not to dwell in that past. Were you having nightmares in the beginning? I had one recurring nightmare. And this is something that um, you know, I've never shared. And I think it's important because many people who have been at war or have been through some kind of traumatic uh, experience like this have post-traumatic stress disorder and nightmares. It was one recurring nightmare that I, I thank God I don't have anymore. And this is part of the survivor's guilt. My nightmare was that I was I was actually tied to a chair on one of the floors, I think it was maybe the 98th floor. While the walls were burning, I was tied to a chair and I'm watching as my co-workers who died are able to escape. And I was left. Now it's the vice versa of people who don't go through this and they're saying, well, I'm, I'm so glad I'm here, but I'm having dreams as if I'm wishing that I was the one who died. Yeah, and I think that, as you say, it's important for people to understand that's what post-traumatic stress disorder does and survivor's guilt does, that you start to question everything. I mean, I can't even imagine, but it's like it, it shatters everything in your world. How do you trust that you can go to work again? Um, that you can go to a movie theatre again, that you can go to be safe anywhere when something like that's happening in our schools, in our workplaces. Um, how did you struggle with that afterwards? Well, when I started going back to work again, it wasn't until two weeks after it happened when my manager, who was in California at the time, said, I need you to go down to Fort Lauderdale to handle disaster recovery. The first thing I asked him was, what floor is it on? And he said it was the first floor. I said, okay, I'll do it. So um, you weren't able to go in buildings for a while in elevators? 
it was it was difficult when I was working in Fort Lauderdale and I was asked to go to the third floor I was looking for the nearest staircase and it and it took it took me a while so were you having panic attacks uh, I was having panic attacks only when triggers would come across so we where I was in Fort Lauderdale was right by the Fort Lauderdale Airport and the planes would actually fly when they were landing they would fly they would descend right over I-95 and you could literally see the bottom of the plane as it's coming down that to this day makes me nervous um, the smell of burning rubber is also a trigger but it's not as much as it was seven years ago now it's tolerable it's something that I understand it's it's okay to feel this way and I can still go on but not have a panic attack every every time I see a plane or I hear a roar of an airplane engine every single moment it gets better and better and better. that's amazing so how have you been able to work through those triggers you know does is it recognizing them to begin with or what's what's been the way to kind of stop them from having that um, deep attachment that causes an anxiety attack I think it's first of all starts with awareness knowing that you're feeling this way and knowing why you're feeling this way not just I'm saying okay I'm upset what is the reason for it and if you know that it is because of something that is from, in, from your past if you know that something from your past no longer serves you then it does not need to be part of your present moment even though that trigger is there you can detach yourself from that that painful memory and use that to move forward and how do you think you know it, for anyone who's been through something like this you're able to start feeling safe again in the world that this isn't going to happen when you go to the cinema or you go to school or you go to work you know, when uh, when that horrible thing happened in the movie theater the first thing I, I thought of was September 11 not because of the acts but because of people scrambling around frantic to get home but then I stopped myself and I said if that moment in time is going to dictate how I live my life then I there's, there's no way there's no way to live that way I have to see myself at exactly where I'm supposed to be and embracing every single moment that I'm here. Yeah. And so in terms of being able to move forward, when do you feel like, because obviously there was a, a strong period of time where you were having these anxiety attacks and um, I remember reading that the first year anniversary was a real trigger for you where a lot of repressed memories came back up. I was actually working that day and Randy, my husband now, he was my boyfriend back then, um, he, uh, actually no, we were engaged actually. Um, we were in this little, the lobby had a deli and I'm walking out and I see the newspaper and it said one year later and it showed the World Trade Center before, not during the attack and that was, that was the trigger. It was almost as if everything came back even more so because more memories started to uh, to emerge. Yeah. yeah it's interesting because I, I went to the Trade Center once um, many many years before the attack and I was young and a tourist and a lot of people used to visit the Twin Towers they were such um, I just remember this sense of it being so majestic and so beautiful that it just it's it's even strange that to me that a place that people used to go to, to see out of all the places that you go in different cities and they were just buildings it's not like it was a um, tourist attraction per se but it was in a lot of ways and there was this beautiful majestic energy there and now it's this place where something so tragic happened and you know Many, many New Yorkers knew about the World Trade Center. And when I got that job, I was working, I was working in, in Midtown, you know, north of where, where the World Trade Center was. And when my, um, that person who got me the job said, oh, you're working in the World Trade Center. I said, what's that? 
to, I had no idea what the World Trade Center was. I'd never even heard of it. And when I worked there, I realized I totally agree with you. There was something about it. When you first walked in the lobby, there was a mall right in the lobby, and there were um, there were the flags of every single country aligned right along the lobby walls, and it was a place where people just were drawn to magnetically. And of course, they had windows in the world, windows of the world that was up on top, and I just I had one of the best times working there. So do you try and remember the good now? I do. I, I just remember knowing that the people who I was friends with are present with me when I do my speaking engagements, even right now. I can almost feel their presence and it comforts me to know that I can find my way to forgiveness knowing that even though they're gone, they can be present in me somehow. Well, and is that something that's been important for your healing, to almost make a meaning out of it and to, to find a way to have them with you in a positive way? There is, I guess it's in everything that I do. If I'm talking to a client and they're just, they're looking at themselves and saying, why does it have to be so bad? There's always an answer. There's always something that I can think of and it's, it's not, I'm not saying that to brag, I just know, I, I just know that through forgiveness and through awareness that people can do whatever they want and feel vibrant and feel alive if they mm -hmm. just look beyond who they are. And well, I mean, what's the alternative? The alternative is that you stay with post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and panic attacks every day for the rest of your life and you're miserable and you have survivor guilt. That's no way for anybody to live, especially somebody as vibrant and beautiful as you with so much to give. So I think that's important for anyone who's been through this to know that there is a way out and it does take time and work. But if they're willing to do that work and they're willing to not numb the feelings, and because in a lot of the ways you have to feel what you're feeling. You have to talk about it and surround yourself by support and community. If you were, I always think of he, uh, healing as like a big jigsaw puzzle. And if you were to think of one or two big pieces to that jigsaw to your healing, what would those key pieces be? That's a great question. I think it's surrounding myself, myself with people who not, not just are like-minded, but know enough about themselves. Those are the people in my life, like my husband, Randy. He was the person who listened to me when I was talking about my trauma and everything else. Those types of people, when they're there for you, those are the pieces of the puzzle that complete the healing process. And also looking within yourself and finding the strength within yourself to be able to speak. Yeah, I think that's a really profound one, That knowing that you are strong enough. A lot of people think that they're going to just collapse into the grief and that they, they're they not able to cope with it, but we are always stronger than we believe. And, you know, I've in my studies I've realized that every time I have broken down and every time that I've said to myself, I can't go on anymore, I can't feel this pain anymore, I realize that that's not me talking, that's my ego. My ego is my ego is completely consumed with grief, and here I am, present, knowing that you're all one, and we're all part of humanity, and there's nothing that can ever change me. Yeah. yeah, that was a moment um, when I was reading through your book, when you talked about how you were all walking together, leaving the site just after the second tower had been hit and you're walking with thousands and thousands of people, almost like a band marching, but you're all covered in soot and debris. But you had this sense, this wordlessness beyond words, that you were all one in this together. And I think uh, silence is profound, because none of us spoke to each other at all. But we just all knew that we had to get somewhere. We all had a mission, and we were all determined to get home no matter what. I think that's one of the that's one of the things that about that day that makes me understand how much how important it is to love humanity 
Yes. Yes. And there would have been a lot of people, I imagine, that didn't know what to say. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of people who've been through cancer and, and rape and different things and they, their family and loved ones in a lot of ways don't know how to relate to them or, or what they should be saying to comfort them. Did you find that after the attacks with any of the people around you? I did because I wasn't in New York. I had moved down to Florida and the number one uh, statement that I get is, I've never met anybody in the towers. Wow. Who were in the towers that day. Mm -hmm. And I, I, did, I wasn't surprised. And some people say, you know, I'm so sorry. And I, at the time, I took it as thank you for your compassion and thank you for your empathy. Now when people say I'm sorry, I say, I understand and thank you. Because I know, when, I know that without that day, I am not the person that I am right now. What has been the greatest gift that's come from this tragedy for you in who you've become? Well, I realized one of my biggest fears was public speaking. When I was in business school, I took classes and I had I got my first C grade and I was very pissed. Um, mm -hmm. But after that, a couple of weeks after, I was asked to speak and uh, in front of you know, my coworkers, and I just realized as soon as I opened my mouth that my truth came out and everything was fine. I didn't have a heart attack afterwards. I was able to go on, and I realized more and more that my life purpose was being on stage or being in front of you and being in front of an audience because there's absolutely no way that I was going to just sit back and be the wallflower that I used to be. I am Michelle Rosado. You are Michelle Rosado and you are no wallflower. <laughs> so what has been the greatest gift of sharing your story? I think the greatest gift in sharing my story is that it, it touches the hearts of so many people because one of my main, the main thing that I tell people is my experience is no or no more or less significant than anybody else's 9-11 experience because someone out there has lost a loved one, some of them tragically, some of them have lost a job in order to pay for their, their kids to go to school. So everybody has gone through something in their life and just because 9-11 was commercialized as it has been, I'm not saying that to be negative, I'm just saying it's been in the media, yeah. it doesn't mean that it has not impacted a lot to so many other people with, it, with their own experience. Mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody who is, you know, shell shocked from a terrorist attack, or um, as we've seen, you know, schools and community areas being attacked? What would you say to them that that first week, that first month later, that they need to know? That no matter how alone they feel that they are absolutely never ever alone and that and, to, and I would ask them who in your life is the closest person that you know that would just be here for you not tell you what to do not advise you as to what you need to do to get over it someone who just listens and what do you think is important for them to understand in terms of you know when your whole world shattered you, you thought you could trust going to community places or work or leaving your kids at school, when that's taken away from you, that um, idea of safety, what is there that people need to hear to start feeling that they can trust again? Or can you? I don't think that there's anything I personally can say to anybody who is fearful because I believe that fear comes from ego. I feel that when people consume themselves and engulf themselves in what the media is telling them, that brings fear into their lives, which ultimately can happen in their own lives if they're not careful. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about what, not attract, but what you see yourself becoming. So does this come back to your point that you felt that you weren't going to let somebody else control how you lived? You weren't going to let it make you um, fear doing everything in your life? That's, so is, that's it a, is it a choice? It is everybody's choice. I believe that everybody lives by their own free will. And, but if you're not careful, 
you can let someone else determine your destiny. Yeah. It's a hard thing, though, when the truth is that you were no longer safe at work after that happened. So it's not a fantasy. It's now a reality. So how did you make sense of that? How did you feel like you could go to work every day and accept the fact that this could happen again? Well, the one thing that I focused on most during that time, because I started, I started practicing yoga and meditation back in 1999. Mm -hmm. So the skills that I learned, I brought into when when I finally found myself desperate. I thought that I needed, I thought I needed therapy. I was going through a very tough time in the one year anniversary, and then I realized that I just want to go back to the source. What is it that, or what is it about me that can calm myself? And what do I have to do to make this happen? And that's when I started to do yoga. Yoga and meditation helped me find out who I really was. Beautiful. So what would you say if you were talking to young Michelle Rosada? There's a beautiful photo of you at your desk five days before the attack. If you were talking to her then, five days before, and you were you had anything you could say to her about the coming weeks that she was going to have to go through, what would you tell her? That you have your whole life ahead of you, and it's beautiful. You just have to embrace it, no matter what. Oh, touches my heart, and. I think that that's such a beautiful message for anybody out there that is going through a trying time that they do have their whole life ahead of them because you were so young and you've now married the love of your life and you're speaking and I think that's another thing I, I hear with a lot of people that they almost want to get back to how their life was before but the reality is your life can be so much more than that if you let it. I, I do see that a lot. I do see people saying it was so great back then. And I, and sometimes I find myself doing the same thing because I was a very, very happy young woman. But at the same time, there that same happiness, even more happiness can be found right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And there are some beautiful memorials and next year they're going to be opening the museum where your book's going to be available. You've donated it to the museum. And we've put all of this up on our blogs and um, copies of your articles and links to everything. Um, are you excited about the museum? How did you feel hearing about that? Well, it was an amazing story because my, my husband and I met with the curator from the 9-11 memorial, not the museum. And she gave it to the curator of the museum and they officially sent me the paperwork in order for us to donate the book. Wow. When I found out, I was so excited. And because the book is not about 9-11 per se, it brings light to what there was. There was a journey before and after 9-11 for so many people. And I wanted to get people to understand that it's not about 9-11. It's about truth and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Well, I am so grateful to you for being here today and sharing your story. Thank you very much, Michelle. Oh, thank you so much, Kirsty. It's been such a pleasure and honor to be with you. It's absolutely an honor for us too. So for everybody out there listening, I hope that you've learned something from Michelle's beautiful, powerful story. And I hope that you understand that life does go on and it can be beautiful if you let it. That understand your triggers, give yourself time, nurture yourself through this. It is a process, it is work that you have to do to look within and move forward when you go through any kind of post-traumatic stress and to really um, figure out what is going on. Is it survivor guilt? Um, is it fear? Is it anxiety? Are triggers coming up to the sense and the smell and, and reminders of all of these things? So I hope that all of you move forward in your life wherever you're at and we look forward to continuing the conversation. We'll be posting the blog, so subscribe on YouTube, share everything, Ask any questions. I know Michelle will be happy to answer them. Tweet, tweet us and Facebook us and we'll see you soon on Kirsty TV. Thank you.